Okay, Quinny, thanks. We've got to wrap it up there. Um, Munster that. Um, that was uh, a big week. A big week for Andy Farrell, a big week for Ireland. Uh, a big week, a big shift in the political landscape on this island. Really, where Sinn Féin just couldn't stop winning. And the Oscar goes to... Sinn Féin. Jackie Arla, I guess, is the phrase of the week. In an in, in Irish rugby sense. Uh, can I just say I find that offensive? Check it out, law. Team of us. Everyone in. <laughs> Richard's rugger thing. On Off the Ball. With Vodafone. Official sponsors of the Irish rugby team. Team of us. Everyone in. Golf Weekly. This is OTB Sports Radio. Okay, you're very welcome along to Golf Weekly, and I'm delighted to say we have a fuller house than usual. We have Fionn Davenport. Hello, Fionn. Hey, lads. We have Nathan Murphy from His Abode. Hello. How's it going, Joe? Peter Laurie also joining us. Hello, Peter. Hello, Joe. And much appreciated. Paul McGinley has made some time for us from, uh, I presume you're over, in, over in, at home in Surrey. Paul, how you doing? Thanks for joining oh, us. I am. <clears throat> Thank you, Joe. Nice to be here. So like everyone, you're in lockdown. Yeah, lockdown is the same in the UK now. Eventually, they've caught up with where Ireland is, and uh, it's on full lockdown. Uh, up until last week, the golf courses were open, and people were going about pretty much their daily lives. But that's not the case now. Uh, only essential travel. Same, same restrictions as there is in Ireland. Um, I'm Luckily, I've got the golf course right on my doorstep here, so I can go walk seven or eight miles a day, which I'm doing, keeping fit. And Other than that, it's lockdown. Nice to have all the kids home. That's the good benefit of it. Yeah, for sure. I mean, incredibly strange time. The implications for golf, as much as anything, are hard to get the head around financially, logistically, and probably in 20 other ways I haven't even thought of. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I've been privy to a lot of those conversations the last week or so, Joe, and I'll tell you what, um, talking to a lot of people I know in the business world as well, I, I think we're heading for, uh, you know, huge implications uh, financially uh, for sport, uh, for business, uh, for people's daily lives, for rates of unemployment. Um, I think economically we're heading into a massive uh, recession uh, on the back of this uh, this virus when hopefully one day we get hold of it, uh, we're going to have to face that. And uh, so the economic uh, realisation of that's coming our way. Uh, we're planning for that very much on the European tour. Um, but in the short term, we're trying to try to piece together some kind of a schedule for the end of season if uh, this can get the other side of this virus as soon as possible. Something we have uh, thrown around between ourselves and maybe you could shed some light on it. Say, for instance, uh, we get back to a point where towards the end of the year there are maybe 10 weeks of normal play available. Will majors take precedence? I would think so, yeah. I would think so. Majors and Ryder Cup would take precedence. I think the FedEx on the PGA Tour, they'll be pushing to get that done. Um, whether they play for the full money or not, that's up for debate. Um, whether they have that big prize month fund that they've been playing for or whether to make it a full event. I think one of the things the tours have and we have in the European tour is the ideas of limited fields at the end of the season are unlikely now because we really have to get 150 players out on the golf course and give them all equal opportunity to try to get some tournaments in uh, should we have a window of opportunity. I think, uh, yeah, I'd say majors first, ride a cup um, and then FedEx and, and some events in the European tour. That's kind of the role there. Yeah, I was wondering that, Paul, because so much of the conversation we've had and everybody has naturally is about those bigger events and getting the superstars back out in course and like this talk of another Tiger Phil match over the next few months just to keep people ticking along. Like, if you're a golfer outside the world's top 100, I'd imagine now must be an extremely worrying time. If so much focus is going to be on the big money events and satisfying those sponsors, if you're somebody who's sort of battling away for your card, you probably got to wonder where you're going to get too many opportunities between now and the end of the year. Yeah, and you know, there's all kinds of things that can happen with that, Nathan. And 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 I wouldn't be surprised to see the two years roll into one. If we don't start till September, um, we we may well just see a rollover from one season to another. No tour school, um, no graduation from the Challenge Tour. Everybody kind of just go out at it as they were and, and give all the guys who just come on and got the card from the Challenge Tour and tour school uh, a, a full year next year, uh, all going well. That. Uh, I think that would be the logical thing to do. You know, we've, we've got to be very fair here and equitable to as many people as possible. Everybody's going to get hurt in some way or another and um, everybody's going to miss out an opportunity one way or the other. We've got to make the best of a very bad situation. 
Yeah. The Ryder Cup has been obviously discussed uh, in various quarters. Padraig Carrington was on the show two weeks ago. He said if it came to a choice between do it behind closed doors <laughs> in September or delay it a year and do it as we know it with full crowds, he'd actually go for it this year in September behind closed doors as much for general uh, morale as anything to have something to watch. Doesn't feel much like the Ryder Cup. Where are you on that one? No. I bet he would. Being an away team, you want <laughs> yeah. to go in without the crowds, don't you? Particularly in America. Uh, yeah, look, I'm all for playing it, to be honest. If we can at all play it, even if it has to be behind closed doors, um, I'd be for playing it. Yeah, you know, these are unique circumstances. Um, I think one of the things we've, we've got to get our head around, Joe, um, and, I, and this relates to all sport, not just golf. You know, let's just say we get on the other side of this virus, um, you know, whether it be May or so. It's highly unlikely um, that any of the governments around the world are going to go, OK, folks, everybody back to where they are. Uh, or back to where they were, <clears throat> excuse me, particularly in light of, you know, potentially a second or third wave uh, of this virus coming through. So it's highly unlikely that they're going to endorse or allow any kind of gatherings of people. Um, so I would say we need to get our heads around um, any sport uh, to the end of 2020 anyway, being played behind closed doors because the government can't take the, can't take the chance um, of mass gatherings again should a second or third wave of this, of, of this virus come through. Uh, but at the same time, I know that they will be keen to get some sport back. Um, but I think that would be the first stage. So, mm. it, you know, if golf has to be that way, so be it. Um, Premier League will be that way. Rugby will be that way. GAA will be that way. I think that's what we're all facing realistically uh, in 2020. Yeah, it's quite surreal, really. Uh, Fiona, I know you're uh, looking on in as much shock generally as all of us. Yeah. Um, uh, the whole, I mean, like Paul, I'm, I'm in lockdown here in Manchester. And the, so as you're saying, the UK is kind of now, it's almost become real now. And without getting morbid or macabre, it's just that when you see the rate of infections and, and mortalities are now kind of, it's become less of an abstract issue in the UK and it's very, very, very real. So it, it's strange. You feel like it just refocuses the way we think about everything and, and obviously sport. Um, just on the subject of the Ryder Cup though, and I wanted to put this to you, Paul, Joe kind of, pointed me in the direction of the McKellar pod uh, with Lawrence Donegan and Harrington was on it and I thought he spoke brilliantly about it and what struck me was this he is in full Ryder Cup captain mode because that's how he is he's not going to leave anything to chance <laughs> and rather than kind of like even consider the possibility that the Ryder Cup won't be played he and I'm, and I'm wondering if this is how his, he works, because obviously you know him well, is that he's dealing with the here and now. Right now, the Ryder Cup is still potentially on. So with that knowledge, he is going to do everything he can to be ready, to accelerate the rate of preparation. He was talking about gear, like even just one of the interesting things, which I'm sure you had, is, is that like ordering like equipment, ordering golf bags, ordering shirts, etc., all of these things, and so until that day when they actually say no Ryder Cup, he is going to act as if the Ryder Cup is going to go on, which to me seems like a reflection of a, of a sportsman who is very much focused on what he knows to be true today. Does that make sense? Absolutely. That's exactly where he's at and that's exactly where he should be at. It's very easy to go from that mindset to it then being cancelled. Uh, rather than having it, uh, it's not going to go on, it's going to go on, all of a sudden it does go on and you're not prepared for it. So absolutely, of course he's right doing that. You know, it's a very difficult thing for him at the moment. As you know, captaincy, this time of captaincy, as you go to the run-in towards a team, it's a very tricky period because you're looking at form, you're looking at players, you've got a number of variables going on. Normally, now you put where we are in this current situation and you've got all kinds of other scenarios also thrown in on top of you, mm. potentially behind closed doors, potentially not going on at all potentially being deferred for a year. I mean, all of these things are also going around in your head. So it's very easy to lose focus. Um, yeah. And I think that's where you're right about Pollock. That's where he'll get in and, and stay focused on, on what's important, which is full steam ahead. As far as I'm, as I'm concerned at this moment in time, full steam ahead. In a quintessential Harrington fashion, he said he'd had somebody wearing the wet gear in the shower to make absolutely <laughs> sure it's waterproof. 
Yeah. yeah. Uh, he but also said probably himself that. wearing the wet gear. Oh, I can you know, imagine. You don't want a Corey Pavin. <laughs> Uh, he also said, I mean, he'd be, uh, not shockingly, more than happy to make the 12 Ryder Cup picks himself if required. Uh, so say that, you know, things come back into play July, August, a little bit. Is there any way uh, European Tour would countenance given Harrington all 12 picks or will there be some algorithm that decides? I'd say it's a bit of both. Um, I wouldn't say all 12, but there will be some kind of an algorithm, I'd say, drawn up. That's the easy bit, Joe. The hard bit is getting this done, if we are going to get it done. Um, picking the players, yes. Look, I mean, if you look back to the SIF, everybody remembers 1997, Miguel Martin was in the team and Sevi was the captain. And Sevi found a way of getting him out of the team because he had been injured. <laughs> um, and you know, <laughs> you're laughing, Pete, because you were part of that. Um, and uh, it was, you know, we were all... No, no, I, I just remember it. I remember Savvy getting rid of him. Yeah. yeah, we were all part of the Ryder Cup committee at that time, do you remember? And it was all kinds of scenarios going on about it. And, you know, how could you get him out of the team? And Savvy was adamant that he wasn't to play. He'd been injured and all of that. So I think they got him into the team photograph with all the uniform and all that. But anyway, he could have deal with him and it wasn't done. So picking the team, um, I don't think that's as difficult as everybody else is making it out to be. Okay. I think there'll be a... a you know, a, a proper, fair way of doing that. But certainly, Podrick's picks will have to be increased uh, from where they are at the moment. Okay. Well, there's a few things we want to get through. I mean, I should tell the listeners who are not seeing things at the moment, we've all gone different routes with our hair situation. I think in the main, we're just uh, leaving it as was. But Paul, uh, Nathan, Fio and myself, we're, we're, we're going to hang in there for a while. Peter Laurie has obviously felt he's in this for the long haul and somebody has done a right number on his scalp. Was it yourself uh, or was it one of your no, kids? No, I, I, I let the kids have a go, just for the crack. <laughs> they were bored. They fell <laughs> in painting and decorating and all the rest. So we took out the razor and gave it a tree all over. So it'll grow back. I'm lucky to have hair that grows back, so I'm okay. When you were on last week, Peter, you were giving what I thought was a very kind offer to the Golf Weekly listeners that if they needed a golf mat for out in the back garden to give you a call. Are the rumours true that these golf mats are 250 quid a pop? <laughs> no, no, no. I got a beauty. A, um, uh, quite some time ago, we did a podcast and um, there was a guy who res who who went on Twitter and cared about the podcast. But Peter Laurie was talking shit, is what he, he said. And uh, I'm like an elephant. I, I, I'll, I'll remember these things. Uh, and, of course, he uh, sent me a, a, a tweet looking for a golf mat. And I said, sure, no problem. For you, uh, the price just goes up because of your tweet. And I, I photographed the tweet that he had sent out onto the, you know, the World Wide Web. And they, uh, he responded with a, uh, a, uh, an unhappy face. There you go. Well, I, I think this what this today does is give us a real opportunity, Peter, because you come on and, in fairness, you're, you're very honest when it comes to being on various European tour committees and give us little bits of insight into things that happen. And we have to go along with your story because, obviously, we've never been there. But now Paul McGinley's on the line, and I think we can get the real truth <laughs> of what Peter Laurie was like when he was on these committees, Paul. <laughs> uh, we had to muzzle him a few times uh, he was very forthright with his opinions uh, but it was good I mean Pete that was good I enjoyed sitting in what those committees is what you get that was, that, that was a strong uh, that was a strong committee you know I mean you look you know Monty was on it Bjorn was on it Clark was on it Peter Peter Laurie was on it Paul Laurie was on it uh, Jimenez was on it um, you know it was a very strong committee and we made some big decisions and um, I was just reflecting on it during the week, actually. You know, w one of the things, um, I don't know if you were on the one peak post-2008 when after Faldo's captaincy, were you? You probably were, weren't you? That? Yeah. And uh, we had that strong meeting post his captaincy about how we were going to go forward on it. And one of the things that I do reflecting on that one was one of the things that came out very clear was as much as, yeah, things went wrong under, under Faldo's captaincy, I think we made uh, a big mistake as a committee as well by not forcing him to be a vice captain um, and experience that vice captaincy role before he elevated into being a captain. And so there's lessons learned all the time, and as a result, we haven't made that mistake since. You know, even Podic with his big CV um, as a player has now done three vice captaincies, so we feel he's very well equipped to step up into the captaincy. So, you know, good decisions from people um, with forthright opinions is important in any committee. Yeah. And was it just that Faldo had six majors and didn't feel the need to be a vice captain? Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. And, and you know, that's what happened, Joe. And, and I think we learned a lot as a committee. And, and as much as Faldo got criticised for that, and yes, there was certainly mistakes made in a way, 
we let him down as well, to be honest. We let him down as a committee. We hadn't him properly prepared. You look at all the captains that have been since. We've all had a number of vice captaincies. Uh, that succession planning is really important. Mm -hmm. And no matter how good a player you are, in fact, you could have the argue, other argument, the better player you are, the more vice captaincies you have to do because that mindset of a player is very, very different, particularly a top player, to being, to being a captain in a Ryder Cup. And I think that's one of the uh, secret ingredients in why we've been so successful mm. um, in, in, in Ryder Cups. Well, on that McKellar oh, podcast that uh, Fionn mentioned, Harrington did say on that, that he learned more being a vice captain than he learned mm. in all his playing Ryder Cups put together. Yeah. That's the big learning. Yeah, exactly. Theory. And he was, you know, it was interesting. He was saying that he's already trying to be warmer with potential players at the moment. So if he's on the way to the range, he stops for a chat. He doesn't want to be standoffish because they could read too much into any perceived slight. So he's thinking of all these things. And he was recalling, and you'd obviously have experienced this as well, he was saying he loved uh, Langer as a captain, for instance. And, you know, mm. headmaster, standoffish. He recalled uh, one of the meetings after a day's play, this kind of boardroom setting, and Langer very involved in the golfing decisions. So I think he said, you know, that ravine on the fifth, nobody is to lay up of that ravine going forward. And Harrington was sitting there full in the knowledge that he was the only player that day who had laid up. And, you know, Langer, Langer would be involved in your club selection, potentially, you know, really hands on. And Harrington loved that, but was acutely conscious that some players would dread that, like stay away from my mm. space. Uh, we, what Ryder Cup captain did, did you respond the most to and why? Yeah, I mean, Sam was the one that I responded the most to. Um, but just going back to Langer there, I mean, I learned a lot from Langer as well, too. Um, I don't know, Patrick, I haven't heard that podcast yet, uh, but I will look out for it. Um, yeah. um, and I don't know if Patrick told the story about Langer on the uh, 13T, did he, in, in Oakland Hills? No. Didn't tell that story. Oh, this is a great story, too. It shows you Langer, because I was the opposite now when I was captain. But Langer stood on the par threes. Um, and we were, I think we were playing the fourth match on the Saturday, myself and Harrington against Tiger and Davis Love. Love was third in the world at the time, and, and obviously Tiger was in his pump. And uh, we might have been one up at the time. And it was a short par three, about 145 yards, with a, with a two-tiered green, big, big, strong shelf, um, to a very narrow... Uh, top tier and behind that top tier there was a bunker and uh, uh, so it was Harrington's shot we were playing this was foursomes and it was his shot so uh, Langer pulls the two of us over and says Pardick what are you going to hit and Pardick says what's the yardage he said 145 he said well probably a little soft nine iron and Langer said no Pardick you're not to hit that club uh, you have to hit a wedge and he said no 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 I, I can't it's, it's 138 to the top tier I won't, I won't hit a wedge that far I don't care he said I want you on the bottom tier you're not to hit it on the top tier um, so Harrington said, okay, uh, so he hit his wedge and it pitches into the middle of the slope, like he said it would, and it rolled all the way back down to about 50 feet and across all the crowd, big stand behind that tee, go, woo, and everybody thought it like it was a really poor shot. Um, then Tiger stood up, um, with the most beautiful three quarter spinny nine iron. It was just a glorious shot coming off soft, pitched about two feet from the pin, one bounce back bunker, all right? The top tier was rock hard. Yeah. So Davis Love gets in. He's got no shot. He hits a brilliant bunker shot, but of course it goes past the flag, catches the clear, back down to where I was. And we, I put it up to two feet and probably hold it and we won the hole. But there's just an, an idea of he had stood on that tee. He saw the top tier was unholdable. If he, no matter how good a shot you hit in, it wasn't going to be held. And that was the value of, of a captain getting involved with strategy of a team. Um, um, would some would now, some would some players have been in the locker room saying, "I just this guy is suffocating me. Get out of my face, Langer." Yeah. Yeah, well, that's, that was my view. My view was I didn't want to tell the players. It wasn't my job to stand in the fairway and say, hey, by the way, this is a five iron, not a four iron. You know, whoop to Rory in the middle of his game and saying, hey, I think you should do this. I watch the win here. My view is, look, they're brilliant players. They got great decision making, them and their caddy. And, I, and I, when I had the caddy meetings, I said, look, guys, I'm not going to get involved in any decisions that you two make on the golf course. For I, I wanted to preserve that and make a sacrifice on that relationship between the player and the caddy. You've made great decisions to be where you are. It's not for me to get involved. And if I do need to get involved, I will go to the caddy first to see if it's okay if I can speak to the player. Mm. Um, so that was the way I saw it. Now, Langer saw it differently. And, and there's no one way of captaincy, Joe. And that's what's uh, so intriguing about the job. Uh, no yeah. one is right and no one is wrong. Just on, on, on Woods, because that's the famous year when Mickelson and Woods go out together, I think, against Harrington and Monty. Yeah. And, you know, that, that's maybe a low point in terms of Woods' relationship with the Ryder Cup because he's so dominant as an individual at that stage. What did you observe in him at that stage at Oakland? Um, well, I remember 
well, we got two down after two in the second part. It was, it was a great story, the game. I mean, we, we, we played the first hole. Uh, I remember it was Paul Dick's honour. Um, uh, but Ameri- sorry, America had the honour. And Tiger stands up and rips his three wood down the middle. Big high tee box hitting down onto the fairway. Uh, and then Pardick had to follow him. Pardick had got beaten badly in the morning with, uh, with Monty, I think it was. They had a bad being. And Pardick didn't play particularly well. So his confidence was down at lunchtime. We're trying to talk him into you know, getting his confidence up. And then he, he wasn't looking forward to the afternoon match. Um, and anyway, he stands up and you know, he takes forever. You know when he takes forever, he's not confident. He, that's why he hits his pull hook way left up against the out-of-bounds fence. About six or seven hacks later between the two of us, we still weren't even on the fairway. So, so uh, Love didn't even hit a second shot to the first hole uh, and we had conceded at that stage. We won down. Second hole, they made an eagle. Tiger hit a four iron into two feet and my drive uh, party couldn't get home in two. Uh, so we're two down after two, and we kind of we kind of got back into it. And we started playing against the golf course, and we started to say, right, let's give ourselves two over par, and let's play against the course rather than playing against these two. And one thing led to another. And what surprised me more than anything was that once we got one up in them, they started making regular mistakes and making bogeys, um, which which really was surprising. Uh, almost, I can't say disinterested, but certainly tuned out mentally um, mistakes that you would never see him make because 2004 he was right in the middle of his pump uh, and Davis Love is a nice guy it's not like there was an edge between the two of them but certainly the focus uh, between you know in terms of the, the level of golf that he was playing um, it didn't seem to be there uh, that week compared to what he was doing in an individual so yeah there was obviously agitation going on he didn't want to be there there was yeah he was certainly uh, what would you say defocused um, and not tuned in at all to what was going on uh, Paul, there was a, in in this same podcast, Harrington tells an illustrative story. I guess is to showcase that, that part of the, the 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 task of any captain is obviously is navigating complicated personalities and pairing people up together and understanding the dynamics between various players. And he tells a story about the two of you playing in the World Cup in '97, and that that apparently there was a. There, he was saying there was a, a curfew. You had to be in for six. But you were, and he goes, Paul was the captain. Between us, Paul was the captain. And Paul was like, no, we're going to go out. And we're going to have a drink. And he had his Diet Coke and you had your whatever. And, and he says, and you arrive, you always arrive back just a little bit late. And, and what I guess what Harrington is saying is, is that at the time, I would have always taken the lead from Paul. And that suited me and it suited us. And we worked well that way. It's that you can't have, I guess, in the sense of between Phil and Tiger, one of the two has to be a captain of the two. And Phil was never going to be, Phil couldn't be captain because Tiger was the better player and Tiger could be captain to nobody. So is, is that some, do you, first of all, do you remember that? And second of all, is, is that yeah. how, how important is understanding that dynamic between the two players? Yeah, that's a great question, Fiona. And, and... I feel very strongly about that. Absolutely important. And it doesn't necessarily have to be that the better player is the captain in that Mm. relationship. Um, So, for example, you look at Sergio. I mean, Sergio is certainly a guy that I felt pairing him, he needed to be with somebody stronger than him. Mentally stronger, just a strong personality. Um, You know, Alazabal and him were great partnership. You know, him and A's and him were great partnership where both of those other guys took the lead over Sergio. Whereas Sergio taking the lead over, say, somebody like, um, you know, a Per Folka or even a Paul McGinley, that wouldn't have been a good dynamic for Sergio. Uh, I felt the same with, with Justin. I felt the same with Henrik. Um, that, you know, Henrik was a strong personality there um, between the two of them. Um, so I think that's very important that that dynamic is there. And, and, and some players need it more than others. Um, and I think Sergio was certainly somebody. Westwood is another one that he played very well with because Westwood was that strong personality. And, and, and that strength on his shoulder makes Sergio play better. Is Rory a surprising one in that sort of dynamic then? Because you think back to 2018 at La Golf Nacional and he goes out on the Friday morning and very much the entire build-up is Rory is the natural leader now of Europe for the next generation. Goes out with Torbjorn Olsen. Doesn't really happen for him at all to the extent where you're wondering if he'll go out in the afternoon. He's put out there with Poulter for the afternoon and Poulter's suddenly mm. the main man and he just seems to drag Rory with him. That, that maybe Rory's position yeah. in the Ryder Cup won't be the one he expects for himself over the next decade. That he doesn't need to be that natural leader. He just needs to be the best player and let the other people maybe be the more outgoing leader types. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, again, you know, um, 
you know, one one of the I, I put him with Sergio. I, I put him with Sergio for that reason, thinking that he will be the strong one with Sergio. And um, I also, um, you know, the strong personalities are really important. And, and I think, yeah, R- Rory is a tricky one. Rory is a tricky one. It, it's, it's getting Rory mentally into the right space um, is the most important thing, um, and, and not without telling him you know, without telling him what to do. You start telling Rory what to do, he's going to flip the other way. Mm. Um, so you, you, you've, got to, you've got to try to push him and cajole him into, into something that you think is going to work, uh, but he's got to buy into it himself. That's the biggest key with Rory. It's, it's got to be bought into with him. It's got to be his idea. It's got to be something that he is pushing forward and he wants to prove everybody wrong. This is, this is what's important. I'm a great believer that Rory needs to be kicked more. That's when he plays his best. You know, if Rory was a horse and you were riding them, Tony McCoy would be great riding Rory hmm. McIlroy, you know, because the more he's challenged, that's when he comes <laughs> back and plays his best. Um, and I mean, you, you look at some of his best performances in his career have normally been on the back of big disappointments. Um, just look at the way he took off at the end of last year on the back of, of, of the Open Championship and, and missing the cut. You know, he went off to a completely different level in the next couple of months and gone on to win in the FedEx and finishing the year the way he did. He said as much just this week, Peter. He was saying Port Rush was the massive kick up the ass that I needed. And we should be previewing the Masters this week. You know, it's incredible how quickly the world has changed. We mm. should be looking ahead to Augusta and all the excitement and the fanfare of that week. Uh, I, like a month ago, the way everything was going, the way Kepka's form was, the way, you know, Tiger's back seems to be lurking a little bit and he's pulled out of tournaments. And nobody really has caught fire consistently the way uh, Rory has, Peter. If we were previewing the Masters right now, we would be saying, I suspect, this is his time, this is his chance. Absolutely. I totally agree with Paul in relation to, you know what I mean, he does he does play very well when he's uh, coming back from something. Um, and, you know, I said it um, after he missed the cut in, in, in Port Rush um, for the Open. Um, I reckon that probably was the best thing that ever happened to Rory. Um, you can look at everything with positive and negatives. Um, but that was it. It was an actual, it was a positive for his game. And you're right, you know, coming into the, the next major, which is the Masters now, you would have fancied him to do very well. Um, and his game has been in excellent shape. But I, I do believe that, you know, and I think I've said it on the podcast many, many times, um, you know, if, if your horse is running in the Grand National, you don't want your best friend uh, on him. You want the best jockey that you can have on him. And no disrespect to Harry Diamond or anybody else, but um, you know, I just he, he's the type of player that needs a good whip out and and to get him going. And any of the I know from myself uh, and probably Paul will come to this. Some of the best caddies out there, they know what to say at the right time and they can get the whip out at the right time. Some say absolutely nothing at the right time, and that's what it's all about. But um, for, a, for a good professional golfer, your jockey, your caddy, is the mo- one of the most important people you can have on your bag. What about that, Paul? Because with McElroy, there's this sense that if he has a Stevie Williams on the bag, he'll quickly get rid of him and rebel against that kind of authority. Yeah, I, I think he will. I, I think he would, to be honest. I, I think Steve Williams would be a bad relationship for, for, for Rory. Um, I think it's more of a mental mindset. I mean, I look at the relationship with, with Harry um, and, and I look at the role of the caddy when not being privy to what's going on on the golf course because we obviously can't hear what's been said between them. But I don't see a lot of mistakes being made. I don't see a lot of course management mistakes. I don't see him getting the clubbing wrong a lot. Um, you know, I don't see the, the normal um, criticisms that you would give a caddy, uh, those mistakes happening. Um, I, I think it's more to do with his psyche and I think it's more to do with his mindset before he goes out. And, you know, being lauded in the media and everybody saying how great he is, historically, that's not a great place for, for McElroy. Um, he's better when he's going out, um, like I say before, when he's got pointy elbows, when, when he's pushing forward um, and he's trying to prove people wrong. And, and for me, it's a mindset. And how he gets in that mindset, that's, that's another question. You know, it's the people around him, it's the team around him. Um, and it's, it's his own kind of motivations. Um, that's, that's when he's at his best, in my opinion. It's when he's out to prove somebody wrong or when he's in this semi-pissed off state and he's, on a, he's got a destination in mind and he's walking briskly down the fairway and he's got one thing on his mind. He's got this glazed look in his eyes that Harrington used to have when, when he was in contention. And that's when Rory's at his best. And when he's smiley and happy and chatting with everybody and kind of 
you know, a little bit loose. I don't think that's when he's at his best. Um, yeah. I think he's at his best when, uh, when he's been challenged, really challenged, or if somebody is challenging his authority as a golfer. Um, you know, and the Brooks Kepka thing, um, this kind of edge that Brooks has created, that's perfect for Rory. Yeah. I mean, if you were trying to wind up Rory, it's a perfect scenario. Brooks is doing him an unbelievable favour doing that. Yeah. Um, the fact that he hasn't won this year and been in so many contentions and blown it on a Sunday and every, you know people criticising him for that that's a good thing for Rory because that, that's when he goes okay now I'm going to show you just watch me yeah, and almost, that's when he's at his best yeah almost keeps him honest at the moment because he should have won and there have been a few silly mistakes the, the, the double at Riviera and Mexico had his chances it's been it's been there sloppy, for sloppy times. Joe yeah. Yeah, is that a big, mentally is that a, sloppy is that a big worry because Peter and I talked about this and we were saying we couldn't quite make up our minds. I think we took the more negative angle, actually, which wouldn't be like us, but I think we did in the end, which was, you know, do, do you look at Rory's form at the moment and do you just say, wow, this is all positive, this is just great? Or is there a nagging worry that this guy should have converted maybe at least twice over the last couple of months and hasn't? And is that a good feeling as you go into Augusta? Uh, well, first of all, his game has never been in a better place. His yeah. short game has never been better. Um, he's in contention week after week. His consistency, he'd never been like that. Never been the level it's been for the last kind of 18 months. Um, so um, I would take, it's a bit of both, to be honest. First of all, his game is in a great place. Secondly, he's not converting the way he should. He should have won tournaments uh, this year. He's made big mistakes in a lot of tournaments uh, in the last round. And it seems to be early on that he makes these mistakes. It's not in contention. It's not in the heat of contention. It's early. It's almost like taking the pressure off himself by getting behind. And then when he gets behind, he tries to go again then and races back into a top five position. Um, so it's, it's a mental discipline and coming out of the blocks. And it doesn't have to be coming out of the blocks firing. It has to be coming out of the blocks and hanging around the top of that leaderboard. You know, let the intimidation factor come in. A lot of Tiger Woods, as you look at, you look at how it's been done in the past by all the great players, and certainly I can't speak my whole lot of experience about it, my own career, but I can certainly speak a lot from watching other players do it. Hanging around the top of the leaderboard is the reason why a lot of a lot of tournaments were won by Tiger Woods. He his just his presence forced the others to make mistakes because of his aura, and everybody knows that he's the best player, and everybody knows that he's rock solid. He's not going to make a mistake, so that forces guys out of the comfort zone. And when they're pushed out of the comfort zone, that's when they make mistakes. They crash and burn. You look at Augusta last year. The minute Tiger got in contention in that back nine on Sunday, everybody knew he wasn't going to fall off the leaderboard. He didn't do any heroics in the back nine. He picked off the two par fives and he buried the. 16th and that's how he won and um, and then you know three guys Fino hits it in the water Molinari hits it in the water Kepke hits it in the water and on 12 nice. you know and yeah. all of a sudden guys are making these mistakes now then they try to come back in but the problem is they know that Tiger Woods has not fallen like they've fallen and he's still continuing to go forward and you know there's a lot of that that's a, that's an area of the game that Rory um, needs to improve on because uh, he's got every other facet now particularly technically as well as his putting has, has improved uh, he, he's in a great place um, to move forward with that. But there's certainly, there's a few gremlins in there that need to be ironed out. Um, and, and, and winning is something that, uh, you know, it's hard to say. What did he win four times last year? It's hard to be critical of his win ratio. And he certainly can't say he lacks guile or he lacks anything else. But there's certainly a, a mental discipline that needs to improve to get to that Tiger level. And that's what we're talking about with Rory. We're not talking about, you know, everybody else will be saying how brilliant they're doing top fives every week. But we all know that Rory is capable of more. Mm -hmm. Paul, um, I was watching because obviously there's nothing else to do. So I was watching uh, how the PGA Championship was won at Bethpage Black last year. And you were on commentary for a good chunk of the Sunday. Um, and what struck me, now, of course, you realize it at the time. But in, with a year of hindsight to look back on, is that Kepka dominated in a way that we all imagine or we remember Rory dominating when he won his little string of majors. But, but like, the thing that left me is, is that there's nothing in Kepka's game that would lead Kepka to feel in any way that he is second best to Rory. In any way. Like, he mightn't have the most natural swing that Rory has, but, but that, like, just in terms of length, in terms of short game, his ability with the putter, the mental strength of it that he just seems that Claude Harmon even says is that like, you know, whether he's making a string of birdies or two doubles in a row, he has exactly the same head on him. So does that augur badly? I don't mean badly, but that, is that something that r this new reality that Rory has to take account of, that the golfing landscape has a Brooks Kepka in it, who is in no way intimidated by him in any shape or form. And we obviously have seen how, 
how successful that's made Kepka. I take that point, but let me throw it back at you. Head to head, okay. with six holes to go, both even. Who are you backing? Um, you want to say Kepka? Say Kepka. I'm going to say Kepka. I have to say. I, I, tell me why I'm wrong, because it, it's it's and and I appreciate that Kepka had this glorious 24 month period. Rory has had a similar 24 month period, so they're both capable. But it just in terms of mental strength. It's very hard to see if Kepka's playing well. I just, I mean, I used to think Jordan Spieth was untouchable when it came to mental strength, but it seems to me that Kepka's mental strength is just is shockingly good. Tell me I'm wrong. Okay, well, well, let's go back to Beth Page then. Let's start in Beth Page. Um, this guy was what five, six shots ahead at one stage in the back nine yeah. on Sunday, and then he made what four bogeys in a row. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Dustin Johnson was tied for the lead, playing 17, and made a stupid error with his club decision. You talk about a caddy. You talk about a caddy making a bad mistake, not being on the shoulder to make it. That was a catastrophic mistake he made in 17. He had 188 yards to the flag, slightly into the breeze, with no room behind the flag. Now that for me is a five iron, and I'm not Dustin Johnson with his length. So he was hitting a five iron as well. There was only one place that ball was going. One bounce into the back bunker, made a bogey, and then bogeyed 17 as well and, and 18, and it was all over from then. But, um, you know, if he finished with three pars, Kepka would have lost that lead. It would have four, four or five shot lead that he yeah, had yeah, on that yeah. last day. So, you know, he's not invincible. Um, the fact that he doesn't turn up in a regular, consistent level the way that McElroy does, again, mm. is, for me, is a big mark against him. Um, and now... Last year, he was on a run, and the year before, you can say, yeah, he's on a run, run. There's a lot of expectation now for him to play well in major championships, and I'm looking forward to seeing how Kepka does. Um, mm. How Kepka does now with this expectation on his shoulders. He's created this aura about himself, um, and that, oh, I'm not really interested in, in week-to-week. Uh, I'm only interested <laughs> in winning the majors. Well, that's okay, but now the majors are coming four times a year. Let's see how you do when the expectation is on your shoulders, because he's built it himself. Mm. Um, so I don't like... Has Sorry, Kepka be... not? Uh, has Kepka not at the stage now where he actually has to think about his game? He he suffered badly over the last few months in relation to his you know swing, and he he kind of went, Claude, what are you talking here? I need to go see your dad. So he went over to Butch to find out you know how can you know what's wrong with my swing, and they said, oh, they they got it back in a couple of minutes. However. He's actually put a bit of doubt into his brain now, and he, he always comes across as um, I wouldn't say um, I, how do I put this in, in the best possible way. He, he's not the brightest tool in the box. Um, Is and, that the best possible way you could have put that? My God. <laughs> yeah. Well, who's this? You don't think Kepka's the brightest tool in the box? No. No. And, wow. And yeah. And when he gets a little bit of kind of doubt in there. A little bit like what I what I spoke about with Jordan Spieth when he was the best putter in the world, and then all of a sudden he started missing one or two from short range, and it just went through his whole game like it like like this virus did, um, and it destroyed him, and and he went searching for something that wasn't there was nothing wrong with it. It was just that he was back to normality, and I think Brooks has hit this point now where he is actually back to normality because. You know, he has he has a bad shot. He has a destructive shot in his game. Um, it doesn't come out too often, but there is a destructive shot there. And now that he, he's not going to trust his swing fully, on your bet there, I'd pick Rory down the stretch. It's an interesting one, Peter, though. I mean, given that Kepka's has obviously been injured, so as yet it's all... Well, it's all kind of guesswork. But you, you, do you think that there's a flaw, there's a bigger flaw in Kepka than there is, say, in, in Rory? In, I mean, I realise that Rory has this like immaculate swing, but that Rory, Rory's, Rory's putting can be quite suspect and his approach shots from inside, say, 140, 100 and whatever yards has not nearly been as good. He's improved that massively, though, in fairness. No, no, I appreciate that. that. And, and he's obviously made big strides in that regard. But that, but that and, and you guys know Rory in a way. Obviously, I've never met him, so this is all guesswork on my part. But that, but that Rory can have weird lapses in concentration that, that are, are, can be occasionally quite jarring. 
he, he certainly yeah, that's can. My, that's, yeah. Sorry, ahead, no, I was just going to say that that's exactly the point that I was making, Fionn, that, that you know, it, 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 there's nothing else technically missing in his game. And I, I think he's fixed a lot of the gremlins that he had in his short game uh, with the help of Rod Faxon. And, and now from here, it's, it's, it's a mental discipline, um, particularly when he's in contention, um, to, to, to win more regularly. Um, you know, we all know how good he is when he's inspired and when he plays well. And uh, like he did in Canada last year, he just goes out and he laps the field. But that ability to win on your B game, that's what I'm looking forward to seeing from McElroy. Yeah. That ability to win when the weather conditions are really gnarly and it doesn't suit your game. Uh, that's what I'm looking forward to seeing him coming up with a, with a 70 or a 71 in really poor weather conditions or, or winds that are blowing 30 mile an hour. Like, I've, you know, I've quoted a number of times before, what has he won 30 odd times and, and uh, never would a winning score less than 12 under par. I want to see him winning on a tournament where a winning score is five under par. Yeah. You know, they're still the, the big challenges that are facing McElroy. And if he needs motivation, they're the kind of things he needs to put away so people can't, uh, like me, can't, can't say, well, he hasn't done this, he hasn't done that. Because if you want to be the complete player, uh, like Tiger Woods was, and he's the bar, remember, he is the gold bar. He's raised the standard so high um, that, that they're the challenges that McElroy faces. And, and uh, they're the things that should get him out of bed in the morning and into the gym. Um, it's to win. We all know how great he is with his A game. Um, let's see. Let's see him uh, winning when he has to play a little bit on the back foot. But yeah, is there okay. something well, a little gonna, bit? I'm just going to. Sorry, Fiona. I'm just going to move it no, on no. because there's a, there's some quick fire questions we want to get to. I don't want to take up too much time, so they're they're kind of streamed in this afternoon, and there's loads here. There was one I wanted to put to you, Paul, because we never really asked you about uh, your now late caddy. I'm sure it's very sad to say, Edinburgh Jimmy Ray. Jimmy. Yeah, mm. who passed away. Uh, European tour for 30 years. I saw lots of wonderful things said about him. Thomas Bjorn, for instance, said, as a young pro, he was the scariest man I had ever met. Getting to know him, he was the kindest with a wicked sense of humor. RIP, my friend. He seemed like an incredibly uh, popular presence on tour for 30 years. What did he do for you? Why was Jimmy your guy? I think loyalty more than anything else, Joe. Um, You know, yeah, he was an old school caddy. Uh, he didn't suffer fools, but he was fun. Never once did he ever turn up on all the years he caddied for me. And he started for me in 92. Um, and never once did he ever turn up in bad form. Never once did he turn up uh, unshaven or unshowered. Or uh, Yeah, of course, he liked to drink at night and he had a few other vices as well. <laughs> but <laughs> what he was was fun. You know, he was great company. Um, he was absolutely great company. He had a quick word for everybody. Nobody finished one up on him. He always had the last word, no matter where. I mean, Pete's got some great stories in him too. Um, and <laughs> he used to give Pete and the Grain some serious stick to them together. So maybe Pete can elaborate more on that. The great news oh, is, Jimmy, Pete, Pete, you can't libel the dead. So, I mean, you can say what you want about him. <laughs> no, it's a dreadful Jim, thing. Jimmy, Jimmy was one of the best. He really was. Okay. And, and, and funny enough, when he carried for uh, Paul there, when Paul was Ryder Cup captain. And Jimmy was just so happy because he was going to be the man at the Ryder Cup. And, and he was the man. Um, and he, 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 instead of... He, he, we, used to, we used to chat with him on the range and they, uh, we, we'd say to Paul, Paul had, had come out every, every so often with a new sponsor uh, because Ryder Cup captain, you know, he was, he was being well looked after. And we'd go, Jimmy, where's your logo? And Jimmy go, don't, 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 don't talk to me about that. And he'd start giving out yards at the beginning. <laughs> and it would be hilarious. <laughs> you could wind Jimmy up and then you just send him off to begin. <laughs> and there'd be, there'd, be, there'd, be, uh, there'd be war, there would yeah. be. But uh, yeah. no, Jimmy was one of the nicest guys. Uh, he carried for Damien McGrain there for a while. Right. Um, and just some of the stories that he'd come out with were uh, absolutely... You, you, you couldn't tell some of them, um, and then you could tell a few others, but uh, he was one true gentleman of the tour. Right. And is that what, is that, was that his real value to you, Paul, uh, the atmosphere he brought, or was it, you know, he was a, an expert caddy as well? Uh, I was an expert caddy, and particularly when the conditions were gnarly and it was windy and it was cold and, you know, like Dunhill Cup kind of weather, that's when he was at his best. Um, reading greens, particularly those old linksy greens, 
in the Open Championship. Great at reading those. Um, you give him a yardage book and a green book and all that kind of stuff. I mean, he took forever. I ended up having to have my own yardage book because he took forever to add the numbers up. So it's like, Jimmy, l- let me do it. Let me have the book. You just, you just, you just, you just eyeball it, okay? And between me reading the number and you eyeballing it, we get it right, and and, and we did. Uh, but he was great fun, very loyal. I mean, he was part of the family here. Um, you know, uh, I'll just give you a, give you a little little uh, little example. Uh, the last time I saw him, actually, really sad. He carried to me in Sunningdale. Uh, probably was Christmas Eve, and uh, no, it wasn't. It was the twenty third. But on Christmas Eve, we were going to have um, a small party in the house, and um, Jimmy. Uh, so so Jimmy was coming. Jimmy's part of the family, and all the kids. They call him Big Fat Jimmy. Is what he, what he was called by by all <laughs> the kids, and. Um, so anyway, cut long story short, my daughter went into hospital. Um, she had a kidney infection when she spent it, she spent ten days or so. So I had to cancel the cancel the party. So Colin was says, I, I, and uh, I couldn't get him. Uh, and next of all, the door opens, and and he walks in the front door, and he's got this big flagon of of vodka. You know about this, Pete. He, he, this is what his vice, one of his vices was vodka, um, but it was Smirnoff. And uh, I says, what are you doing? And he just walks straight past me into where the cupboard was where we keep the drink, and and he said. Uh, he said, I brought this for the party tomorrow night because I'm not drinking that crap that you have in your store. Of course, I have Grey Goose, which is four times the price, but no, he wouldn't drink that. It had to be his own, his own vodka. And that was the last, that was the last story I have of him um, yeah. because he went in the hospital the next day and, um, and, and, and kind of our whole Christmas period was all over the place uh, with everything. And, and next of all, I know I, I get a phone call from his neighbour, um, a, a lady that he was friends with, to say, look, I haven't heard from Jimmy for two days. And, uh, he gave me a key uh, to say, if someday I, didn't, I don't come down to see you, there's a key to my house. There'll be something wrong. And uh, so she went in and found him. Uh, he, he died in his sleep. Um, so we had a great send off for him. We, uh, we, we got a really nice funeral put together up in Scotland. Um, we had about 50 caddies, uh, some players up there too. Uh, and he got buried in January. It was a really nice send-off. Uh, it really was. And I was going to do something at the Irish Open as well, which is now being cancelled, which is a shame. I was going to do a, an evening for the players and caddies and TV crew and everybody who knew him and have a couple hundred people together for that. But we'll defer that for some other time. Yeah, OK. Well, listen, um, condolences to all concerned. Very, very sudden and sad. And um, There were quick-fire questions people wanted to throw at you, so go as quick as you want here, Paul. Keep an eye on the clock. Whenever you need to shoot, you can shoot. Uh, we just threw it out, everything and anything for yourself and Peter, if there's anything they wanted to ask you. So um, somebody wanted to know, Dave wanted to know, uh, who gave you the, because uh, you met various people obviously in the build up to 2014, who gave you the best nugget of advice or uh, what piece do you remember now, which has kind of you know, stood the test of time, the person, I guess, who made the biggest impact on all those brains that you picked? Um, well, in terms of brains that I picked, well, first of all, the most learning I had was from Sam Torrance's captaincy. Uh, I learned a huge amount from that. Uh, but in terms of leading up specifically, I, everybody's going to think that I'm going to say Alex Ferguson here, and I learned a lot from him, no doubt. But um, I'm going to say Michael Vaughan, the ex-England cricket captain. Um, and he said to me uh, the importance of a plan, and he explained the importance of a plan and how it was important that you had a plan, but you had different outlets from that plan. But that it's easy to say, oh, yeah, I have a plan. But he said, oh, it should be written down. It should be clear. It should be absolutely crystal clear. And that plan needs to be communicated to everybody in the team. So just that, that kind of advice. I know it sounds simplistic, but it's amazing how you would kind of wing it. Yeah, I have a plan. But no, do you really have a plan that has lots of, lots of elements to it and contingencies? Uh, KB said, say all golf is cancelled post-COVID-19 and you can go back and play one hole anywhere in the world before it's all levelled. Where are you heading? I mean, he could have just asked, what's your favourite hole? But I guess everyone's feeling a bit <laughs> at the moment. At the end of golf, what's the last hole you're going to play, Peter Larry? Wow. Well, um, I'd say probably Crans, Montana. Um, maybe the something like the seventh hole in Crown, just with the views and stuff like that. Paul? Uh, I'm going to go with a place I know Fionn knows well, uh, Ross Penn and Donegal. Um, oh, yeah. Mom and dad are from there, and I spent all my holidays up there as a boy. Still go up there regularly. Uh, in fact, we're hoping to have a seniors event there uh, this year, but that looks un- maybe unlikely. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to say Russell Penna and probably the sixth hole, the par three, six, right out in the corner. Gorgeous. Yeah, never been. Not the oh, ninth. Amazing. Really is amazing. 
What about the nine? Oh, well, the nine funny. Funny. Yeah, I know. Yeah, there's so many great ones. I mean, Critch Island oh. as well too. You know, you look, you look at that. I mean, there's Donegal is really is is amazing place. It's such an mm-hmm. undeveloped place in a golfing context. And um, I think, hopefully, in the next ten years, we'll see we'll see more of it rise into prominence. But uh, yeah, certainly Donegal will be the first place that comes to my heart. Uh, Thomas Byrne here, friend of the pod. Paul, any stories of your time in Colosh to Aina? Did you frequent the smoking bike sheds and do you remember Dicey? <laughs> <laughs> of course, absolutely. He was my maths teacher. All right. Uh, and a great teacher, yeah. <laughs> so Pete was there too. Pete's Colosh to Aina and Pardick. Amazing. All three of us yeah. ended up on tour from the same school, Christian Brothers. Um, yeah, I had a great time in school. Look, people look back on their childhood and they think, oh, God, this and that. But I had a brilliant childhood. Um, it was very much revolved around GAA. It was very much around the typical Irish Catholic suburb, semi-detached house, like like all of us, most of us. Uh, as a fella said to me uh, once, I, I was having a coffee in, in Churchtown and a fellow walks by to me, a real dub. Um, and the fellow I was with introduces, I said, do you know Paul McGinley? Jesus, he says, I know you, McGinley. You know what I love about you? You grew up, you grew up with lying on the kitchen floor like all the rest of us. <laughs> and it was such a Dublin term and it was so light. <laughs> that is absolutely extraordinary that the three of you went to the same school, Peter. Like yeah, Malcolm, Mal- Malcolm Gladwell needs to get in there and find out what happened. That is extraordinary. Oh, I got some great theories on that. Go on. We were oh, all from I, the same I area. A lot more time then. <laughs> <laughs> need a lot more time on that but not maybe not so much the school but certainly the the courses we grew up on um you look at the style of players all three of us were you know pete was very very straight um didn't make too many mistakes very much like a newland style of golf course uh, i grew up in the grange where you've got to move the ball hard right to left and left to right and you got to play the par three as well and you know for a period of time there in my career i was the best par three player in the world uh, according to stroke average and then you look at Podrick where no matter how good you play with the shapes of the of the greens up in uh, in Stackstown, yet you know the best you're going to hit 13 greens around. So you know most days you're going to hit nine or ten, even if you play well. So there's a lot of chipping and putting involved, and and uh, and battling the elements, which ended up being the kind of style of player that Podrick was. So I, I think there's a lot in that that Malcolm Gladwell and, yeah. and Matthew Said as well too wrote a book uh, something yeah. similar on it. I think there's a lot in it, a lot in in our upbringings um, and 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 how we kind of. Um, cut our teeth as, as professional athletes. Well, where I'm currently sitting is a two-minute walk from the Grange. What is the punishment during this crisis if I hop over the wall and have uh, 18 holes, a quiet 18 holes? <laughs> Don't think anybody would well, see you, would they? Yeah. <laughs> Fire ahead. We're doing a little bit of, yeah, we were, we were doing a little bit of work up there, changing a couple of bunkers. Um, my design company has been doing that, but it's been halted at the moment. So you might see a few diggers and, and all that in place. We're hoping to get all this done under the cover of uh, of the course not being in play, but I think that's been stopped now, unfortunately. Owen wants to know, when will Paul do some online training videos like Harrington? I mean, there's no room left. There's no bandwidth left after Harrington's videos. There's that many. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I, given lessons in golf, I don't think it's my 40. I mean, that's what Pardick will do. You know, I think when Pardick finishes his career, you know, he'll have academies and, and he loves teaching. He loves talking about the game. He loves the second and all that. That's not really my forte. I prefer to do other uh, other kind of things. I mean, I love the leadership kind of thing, for example. And I love uh, a lot of discussions and that. And that's what I spend a lot of my time doing. I certainly, what I've done actually the last uh, the last couple of weeks, like everybody, uh, I've been clearing out. And I had about 3,000 books that I've condensed it down into my office here where I've got about 500 left. And it's amazing how many great books I've collected over the years. So delving back into those and, and, and uh, with my mindset now compared to when I bought them or when I read them first, kind of 10, 15, 20 years ago, uh, I'm looking forward to, I'm, I've been going through some of those with a different, because I'm in a different space in my life. It's amazing. Uh, it's good to kind of use, use the time productively. Yeah, you take different things from them is the interesting thing. Mm. Somebody did tweet in asking for a book or film recommendation. It can be golf or otherwise. Uh, book a recommendation. Uh, I've been watching a great show on TV with my son as well too. Anybody's ever watched it? It's on Sky Q now called Curb Your Enthusiasm. Have you ever seen that? Oh, I love it. Yeah. 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 Oh, how funny is he? I He's brilliant. The social awkwardness appeals to you in that show, yeah? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I just think he's so funny. <laughs> Come here. So Speaking of great, books, great sorry, lads. Uh, sorry, I'll just um, say, if, if, I, if I had to name someone who was closest to Larry David, it probably would be Peter Larry. That's just, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> well, yeah, it's true. 
Have you seen the Have you seen the Larry David the the warning video where he's telling people to stay in? That was brilliant. Is it? Um, come here, Joe. Just speaking of books, have any of you? I just started reading it yesterday, so I'm only about thirty pages in. But Michael Bamberger's new book on Tiger, and it starts with Tiger being arrested when whatever it was in a couple of years ago when he was picked up yeah. and he was out of his mind and and it's that arc that 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 span from 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 2009 up to winning the masters it's so far it's sensational stuff oh. really beautifully written because i just called this after the previous one uh, the armin katayan one because uh, paul kimmage was writing about it at the weekend mm. he had read it and reviewed it and he interviewed bamberger and I had just thought I don't need another Tiger Woods book, but it, I, I'm, I'm hearing very good things. Oh, it's 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 absolutely well. Also, Bamberger's a terrific. I don't know if Peter or Paul, you guys have come across him, but I, I rate him. I think he's a terrific writer. He writes wonderfully about golf and sport generally, and uh, and this book is really well written. Very 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 interesting stuff. Okay, let's let's get him on or do a review of it. Nathan, I know you have a few more uh, quick fire questions which people tweeted in. Yeah, Rodri Thomas, we touched on this on last week's pod, uh, considering the current climate. Really interested in how all you guys feel about membership fees. There's a raging discussion here about getting membership fees refunded while courses are closed. But equally, you don't want your course to go bankrupt. Any thoughts? How do you personally feel about it? Paul? Yeah, that's a, getting that balance right is really important. And, and you know, I, I, what I would like, if I owned a golf course, what, what I would be doing would be trying to rechannel the money. So I would give people a rebate, um, but I give them the rebate in terms of either spending it in the pro shop or spending it in the bar or spending it in the restaurant, something like that. So the money does stay uh, spent in the golf club in order to keep the golf club uh, sustainable and, and, and liquid. Peter, I know we touched on it last week. Have you been hearing many stories from the courses around Ireland? I've heard one or two just about to uh, keep their gates closed, actually. A, um, so my recommendation would be very similar to Paul's, would be uh, try and keep the money within the golf club and keep the golf club afloat. Um, you have to remember the golf club probably employs, even the small ones still employ probably 10 people. And that's keeping 10 people, you know, in a job. So uh, hang in there, everybody, and, uh, you know, we'll get back playing soon. Alistair McGarrity, outside of the Irish guys, who were your best friends on tour? Uh, uh, mine would have been David Drysdale, maybe, or somebody like that. Paul? Um, I, I, God, it was all the Irish guys, wasn't it, Pete? I mean, we didn't really, yeah. <laughs> we, did, we didn't want to contaminate ourselves, <laughs> ourselves, <laughs> contaminate ourselves <laughs> in any other country. We, yeah, we let the odd person in. Much in the Ireland, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if we, if we were to talk to some of the English lads, they would just, those bloody Irish, the rudest. <laughs> so unfriendly. Oh. No, no. <laughs> they wouldn't dare. Yeah, we did. We we were very insular, I have to say. Very insular. And the grain with the biscuits and Peter with the Mars bars. That's when we used to go after dinner up to their room. And geez, it was like a little uh, corner shop up there with all the gear they had. The cups you were right, though, the, kettle, the mobile kettle. The one thing you were right about, because I used to eat the sweets the whole time or McGrain did or whoever. And, McGrain, and Paul would say, how do you stay so thin? How do you say so thin? That was the first thing. And then all of a sudden it hit me. Now I realize what he was talking about. And did yourself, or, did yourself or Harrington never take Peter aside about the amount of Coke he was drinking every day? No. No, sure. Look what happened to him when he did go off the Coke. Jesus. That was the end of his there career. You go. I, correct, Paul. At least somebody believed in me. <laughs> this, that this was is unbelievable. Good Even no matter, you're in Malaysia. I mean, everybody's drinking. 15 bottles of water around and Pete would have half a dozen Cokes in the bag. And that's a, no, no water, just Coke. It was quite extraordinary. Quite extraordinary. <laughs> this is a good one from John. I think Paul is on record as saying Monty was the most impressive player he played with. Who was the most intimidating or unsettling? Did anybody ever put him off his game? Oh, Tiger. Oh, Tiger was, yeah. I, 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 I don't, don't think that, that I ever said that Monty was the most impressive. I mean, you can't go past Tiger when you talk about impressive. And, you know, McElroy, you can't go past him when you talk about uh, uh, impressive. But I, I think the point I'm, I might have been making there about Monty was, um, 
he's a guy that if I was doing it all over again, he would be the guy that I, I, w- I would follow, his template of how he went about his business. He just got better and better and better at what his skill set was. He didn't try to be anything different than what he was, just harnessed it, got better at it, got better at it, never got distracted, never start climbing the wrong branch in the tree, just kept consistently getting better. Um, in terms of intimidation, absolutely, Tiger was intimidating. He, he knew how to be intimidating. Um, he used his aura, um, all of those things. He still does it. I see him still doing it in tournaments now. Um, you know, an example last year was was a 12th hole in Augusta. Um, you know, you look out for these things because you were on the receiving end yourself. That when he was wearing the, the red on a Sunday, um, you know, in 12th hole in Augusta, when the two boys he's playing with hit it in the water and had to drop it right at 12, Tiger couldn't wait to get up onto the green, standing on the green, you know, arms folded uh, with the big thing on. Basically, I'm on. My ball's in my hand here. I've marked it on the green. Let's see what you guys can do now. You know, it, it, that's those kind of things. And, and you know, that's that's fair game as far as I'm concerned. It's certainly not a criticism of it. Um, using your aura. And this going back to a little bit about McElroy, you know, Ro- everybody is in awe of Rory as a golfer. And, and I think because he's kind of a nice guy, he doesn't really impose himself in an intimidating way um, aside from his golf the way Tiger did. Um yeah. But I know that he's mentioned in Paul, in Paul Kimmage's pieces yeah. that he didn't want to be that guy. But you know what? If you get an edge, you get an edge. Yeah, he took the words out of my mouth. I was going to say, he's, he's, he's literally addressed that and has said, uh, that's not how golf is. You, you, you just worry about your own game. But that's not how psychology works with those around you. The first time, I've never been starstruck in my life, but the first time in person, it was at uh, Royal Lytham St. Dan's in 2012. The first time I saw Tiger walk onto the range wearing the red, it was as if everything around him went blurry. I mean, it was as close, it's iconic and it does have an effect. And to ignore that and not to harness it, especially when you're in McElroy's position, is probably a mistake because he can absolutely unleash that on people. Mm. Yeah, as I say, I mean, I, I think, you know, looking at Mac, going back to McElroy without making this all about McElroy, sure. going back to his game, I think you know, his game is in such a brilliant place now. All the elements of the technical game, from the putting to the wedge play to the chipping, the arm play to the driving, all of those things are in such a great place now. If you're looking for any further strides from McElroy, it's about it, it's it's a mental side of it, and yeah. it's the it's the it's the um, competitive side of it. You know that's that's where the most uh, gains can be made in his career from here on in. Peter, Just we've all we've uh, we've all played with you, Peter. So present company excluded, has anybody intimidated you? <laughs> oh. <laughs> um. I, I, I suppose I, I, I never played with Tiger, so you know I, I can't put it in there. Um, I, I suppose when I went out initially um, on the European Tour, I think the first time I played with Ernie Els, I was probably intimidated because I expected you know somebody to hit the ball brilliantly for you know eighteen holes, and I actually realised that day that you know tour pros they don't hit every shot perfectly, and you know Ernie shot I think sixty six that day, but he probably hit maybe a handful of good shots. Um, and that was a realization that um, it's not about, you know, how to do it. It's about the score you shoot. Um, and, you know, we can all learn from that. And as Paul has suggested there, you know, Rory can learn from that. It's it's not all about, you know, having your ducks in a row, having, you know, being able to put well, chip well. It's all about getting the ball in the hole and, 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 and getting wins. Um you know, so um, winning ugly or winning pretty doesn't really make a difference. It's 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 when you win is the is the most important thing. Yeah, Nathan. Can I, last, can last I ask? Sorry, yeah, go on, Phil. I just wanted to ask. The, it's just to pick up on this point. Like you know, in football, like when you have like a young player coming on for his first game, the senior, like older opponents will will leave one in on you, or they'll they'll try and intimidate you. It's just a natural thing of like the young bull threatening the old bull. Does that happen in golf with rookies and kind of more experienced players? And if so, is how do they do that, given that it's obviously an individual game? Yeah, well, my experience of it, again, and I was lucky. Um, I, I look back on my, uh, on my career in 93, 4, 5, when I came on tour first. Um, I very much came into the Irish family on tour. Uh, and I was very lucky insofar as Des was very much on his game, Dars was very much on his game, Chrissy Jr., those three in particular. Um, and then myself, Darren, and Owen O'Connell uh, at that time came in. Uh, and we were brought into that family. But it was tough love. It was very much tough love, Fionn. There was no 
yeah, there was banter, there was crack, but we used to always play a practice round on a Tuesday together. Uh, we played for a hundred quid or whatever it was, and and but it was real tough love, um, and uh, there was an edge, a real strong edge to it, um, you know, and not a lot of talking as well too. There'd be a lot of crack and a lot of banter, but at the same time there was a hardness, uh, and that was great. That was great for us. Um, do you see it really in? I, I think the guys coming onto the professional game nowadays are not wet behind the ears the way I was, certainly when I turned mm. pro. Uh, they're coming on, they're full of confidence, they've had big CVs, they travel around the world. A lot of them have signed big contracts, so you know, money is not a, a, an, an urgent need for them to make. Um, and they're like, I can hit the ball better than this guy, and this guy's won five tournaments, I'm going to watch me go. That's mm. their attitude. So I, I don't really see that as being much of a factor now, but I think it certainly was in, in older days. Okay, interesting. Nathan, last few? Yeah, last few. I'm, I'm wary of, uh, of asking uh, this one because uh, Peter Laurie may keep us uh, for quite a while. It comes in from Greg O'Shea. I'm not sure if it's the <laughs> Greg O'Shea from Love Island, but uh, maybe. Uh, he is a listener and a big Golf Weekly friend of the pod. Players lose their temper on the course. Have you called anyone out for going too far? Is it a big no-no for pros to rant and sulk? Have you ever called anyone out, Peter? Oh, I'd say I have, yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'd say I've pulled them aside and said, you know, I'm fed up listening to this SH1T um, and maybe done it very quietly, but I, I, I've definitely pulled one or, one or two aside, all right. What was it that they would be doing that would wind you up? Um, but, uh, I, one of my pet hates is you used to, I don't know whether Paul remember, probably played in Asia quite a bit, but when you play with an Asian tour player, um, they had a habit of, of finishing out and walking to the next tee. They wouldn't stay at the green. They seemed to just go. Um, and that really infuriated me. I, I, it was one of those things because there wasn't many galleries around. Um, and so you'd be hitting your putt and your man might be on the, on the tee box waiting for you. And that used to freak me out. So uh, mm. I had to tell one or two of them um, not to do that. Because the temper point is interesting, Paul. You've got type A personalities, incredibly driven. This is effectively life and death in their own minds. So it's, it's probably hard to control a temper in the worst moments. And yet there must be a protocol whereby you're not distracting your playing partner. Yeah, um, there is a protocol. Yeah, you know, but I learned a lesson very early in my career, uh, Joe. When, when I went to college in America in San Diego, my first tournament I played in, um, was in Torrey Pines uh, and um, I played with a guy called er Earl Morley um, I still remember his name Earl Morley uh, played for USC University of Southern California based in LA um, and uh, he was a big name around California at that time um, certainly in college at golf and um, on it was the fifth hole in Torrey Pines um, he I, I had a putt uh, no he had a putt first and um, from about six feet, and he missed it. And he tapped it in, cursing, all the kind of stuff. And as he's walking off the green, I'm kind of put down my ball and I'm lining up my putt. He lifts up his putter and he buries his putter into the edge of the green. And then he lifts it out of the ground and he walks up the hill. And uh, and I, uh, uh, I'd i never seen behavior like this coming from Ireland. I mean, it was really raw. First time I'd ever been out of Ireland. Uh, and and uh, now I'm in San Diego in California I'm playing this tournament I'm playing with this big guy and all of a sudden he's done this and it's like I couldn't believe what I'd just seen so he's on his way up to the tee just as Pete was saying without looking at me putting out and I still had a six foot putt and I call him back and say hey what are you doing you can't do that you know and just anyway rant and raving at him and he came down he cursed at me and we kind of stood off against each other and eventually he went over and he stood on it and he kind of half prepared it and he walked off I went back and I missed my putt and tapped it in um, and anyway I, I shot 75 or 76 or something in the tournament and afterwards the coach at the head off me um for getting involved he said that's the coach's business and it's my my job and the coach of the of the usc teams to get involved doing that you let that affect your own performance you must never let that happen again and i've always learned that lesson so when somebody was badly behavior i always felt that it was my job now to zone them out uh, and not let it affect yeah. my yeah. affect my uh, affect my golf yeah, because there was a follow-up question from Hugh O'Donnell, which is similar, which is the opposite uh, for Paul. Were there players that were too much crack on course, that people actually that wanted to be best mates on course, that were having too much of a good time, and that your game would suffer if their focus wasn't where it should have been? 
Nah, you, you don't come across that. Guys get the message very no. quickly if you don't want to speak, you know. Tiger was one that didn't do conversation during rounds. Um, you know, you'd ask him a question, but you never got a reply. Um, you don't mean that you literally, know, do you? Sorry, sorry, sorry not, not a reply, but a never follow-on question, you okay. know. So uh, what age are your kids now, Tiger? Uh, they're this, this, and this. Uh, oh, what, what, what do they do? They do this and this. Uh, okay, but that was it. He'd answer the question, but never a follow on. And it was a very clear message that I'm here to play golf and I'm not into chitty chatty about families or anything like that. Uh, and that was fine. You get the message quickly. It's the same with all the guys. And that is the reason there... why we don't need another Tiger Woods, Phil Mickelson televised 18 hole match. Which uh, is apparently going to happen. Mm. For well, charity. I'll take I don't know, I don't know if the PGA Tour will sanction it. I think that's. I think, you know, the PGA Tour, like the European Tour, you know, we're trying to get as many tournaments on before the end of the year uh, in order to activate our TV contracts. So I can't see them unless it comes under um, under the TV contract that they're going to authorise that. It obviously came out today, Paul, about the Open, that they haven't yet made a decision about what's going to happen this year. So while they're having discussions about postponing or cancelling, maybe they're getting some insight from government about being able to play behind closed doors by the time it comes to the middle of July. Of the four majors, is the Open the one that you wouldn't be able to play come October, November, or actually Lynx Golf would it be just fine? Oh, I think it'd be fine. Look at the Dunhill. The Dunhill goes off really well every year, doesn't it? And that's played at uh, October, sometimes October. towards yeah. the end of October. Um, I, what I think is going to happen, and I can say this, um, you know, because it's been widely uh, speculated, um, but, you know, put logic into it, Nathan. Um, you know, if you put logic into it, you say, okay, the, the uh, PGA Championship is meant to be played in San Francisco. The Open, US Open is meant to be played in New York, two very badly infected uh, areas at the moment. Um, so if you move both of those venues down to Southern America, you know, down to, say, a San Diego or a, or a, or a Los Angeles or, or across to the TPC, uh, by doing that, you move away from the badly infected areas for a start. Um, and secondly, by doing that, you're kind of guaranteeing the weather right up until Christmas. You're buying yourself time. Um, and you're buying good course conditioning right up to that time of the year. And you could go into November or even December if you wanted to play um, the major championships. Um, so so that would be a logical thing to do than rather than keeping in the north side of America where, you know, winter closes in a lot quicker. Um, you know, the, the, in terms of the Open Championship, I, from what I believe and what I understand and what I read, it's down with insurances. It's down to insurances. And um, I, I know the RNA rely very heavily on the income of the Open Championship uh, in order to sustain their business year on year. So I'm sure they've got a very, very uh, bulletproof insurance um, policy in place. Uh, and if that insurance policy um, is going to guarantee the income that they would lose out, well, that's probably what they will do. They will cancel until next year. Um, that, that it, looking from the outside, that's what I think, uh, reading between the lines, that's what I think uh, is probably going to happen. In terms of the, uh, the Masters, uh, again, just like those other two in America, if you, you know, down in Atlanta, you can play in nearly up until December in Atlanta. Uh, I know you can't with the changing of the grasses in Augusta, uh, from the Bermuda into the rye grass, you can't play um, pretty much until the last week in September. So I could see a window from the last week in September right up until the first week in, uh, in December as potentially being uh, an opportunity to play the Masters as well. So you could by well get three of those four um, major championships played uh, around that window should we go back to um, playing golf again, uh, mm. which we are hoping for, obviously. Mm. Two last Isn't the issue with the... With, but, I mean, all of that, you can... That... that uh, the weather allows for moving the open or Augusta, but whistling straights, and they've already said they're not they're not going to change the course. You can't play whistling straights much past the third, fourth week in September because the weather just gets too cold. I mean, what is it, Wisconsin? So like there's there's yeah. gonna be snow. I would say the 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 the, the Ryder Cup is looking at a couple of scenarios, John. I'd say it's either looking at sticking to the date um and you know something wonderful happens and we find um, some proper testing or we find um, some proper vaccine um, that it goes on as normal. That's scenario one. I think scenario two is that uh, it's played behind closed doors. And scenario three is that it's cancelled. Um, but I don't see the date moving for the reasons that you just said. Mm. Mm. Two last quick points I want to hit. One, and I wanted to ask you this for actually a while, Paul. So increasingly over the last couple of years, you know, your, your punditry is, is forthright. You say what you think. You say things which I'm sure upset players, players that you know have played with or worked with, 
Have you been given cold shoulder at times on the range or when you meet them? Or have you, has it been communicated to you in places that certain people didn't think too much of what you had to say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You feel it, you sense it, you know it. People tell you, but, you know, some players um, think that I was being unfair. But, um, you know, I'll stand by everything I say. And one of the things, promises I gave myself when I went on uh, TV was never to lie, never to say something I didn't believe. Um, and I'm going to stay true to myself. That's what my uh, loyalty is, is to, uh, is to be true to what I really believe. And uh, I do a lot of my research. Um, I'll never go out on a limb with a strong opinion unless I've got a lot of validation for it. Um, and I've learned a lot. It's a, it's a tough business. It really is a tough business. I mean, you know, put yourself in front of a microphone sometimes and turn off the volume and say, what am I going to say here that's going to be interesting, that's going to attract the people's attention? Um, and I'm not just saying that's a good shot or, or well played. That's a really good drive. You know, you've, you've got to give a lot more than that. Why is it a good drive? Why is it a good shot? What will the player be thinking? Um, it, but it's a learning process and I certainly haven't fully learned and there's a lot more to learn yet. But I'm enjoying it and I feel I'm getting better at it year on year but, because like any business, you've, you've got to learn it. Mm. And then um, before we go, uh, we only got the news after recording last week. Peter, I know you were on uh, with us, the passing of John O'Leary. I'm sure he's somebody that you came across and knew, and it's worth paying tribute to him on the pod, Peter. Absolutely. Very sad. John was a... Uh, he was foster of the European... Um, and just very sad. He'd been sick, um, I believe. Um, so... Uh, it's it, it's a big loss, but a um, you know just condolences to all his family and friends who knew. Paul, I saw quite a few tweets. I think yours might have mentioned it as well. The word "kind" mm. was used about him. Someone who always stopped and had the kind word. Yeah, I I knew him very well, um, Joe, and spoke to him up to two weeks ago. Um, right. Spoke to him regularly. Um, I sat on the board with him um, when I came onto the board of the European Tour. He was incredibly helpful to me as he has been. Um, right through my career, you'd see him regularly. Uh, very nice guy. Um, obviously, a big playing career, uh, winning the Irish Open, played Ryder Cup. I think 1970s, he played the Ryder Cup. And uh, 1975, I think it was, he played. Um, he then got a bad injury uh, in his back and he couldn't play, had to retire early. He then moved into uh, the European Tour um, kind of board and he was chairman of the Players Committee, Peter, that myself and Peter sat on. Uh, for a period of time and um, he also um to be honest when, when the, initially the pga tour and the european tour sorry the pga tour or sorry the european tour and the pga of britain and ireland were all one and then we broke away in the early 1970s uh, john jacobs was the first um chief executive of that uh, and john john o'leary was very much part of the first uh, board that were put in place and and stayed on that board right up until last year um, so he's seen a lot of chop and the changing going on over the years in the European Tour and a guy who's highly respected um, and yeah he, he will be he will be badly missed he, I, I went to see him a few times um, a number of times actually in the last year because he's been uh, uh, he's had terminal cancer now for a year um, knowing that he was dying um, you know going to visit him initially in the hospital and then into his house and, I mean, it was just incredible, uh, his attitude. Uh, incredible how he was so accepting of his situation. Incredible how his spirits were up, how he still wanted out to crack. He used to get out the old scrapbooks and show me pictures and, uh, of, you know, old pictures, tell old stories, what was going on, talk about what was going on at the board at the time. Um, you know, a guy I got to spend a lot of time with and I'm very sad to see him to see him pass. Having said that, he's had a really rough time the last 12 months and in the last two or three weeks, he's been uh, particularly bad as he's been in the hospice. Right. Okay. Well, that's a, a fine tribute. Listen, we, we should thank you because I think we kept you about an hour, just over an hour even. So it's really, it's much appreciated. Uh, that's all right. We uh, it it's on. not like I'm busy at the moment, Joe. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're here again next Thursday. <laughs> yeah. Can I, can I ask, can I ask a uh -oh. question to Paul? And, uh -oh. and no, this is, this oh, no. is not bad. You've been waiting an hour and a half in this kid. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I told you I'd throw one in there. No, no, this is a good one though. Um, looking at the um, contract that the European Tour have with Sky, um, or something, or one of those contracts. I'm not looking at the contract, but you know, just looking on the outset. Um, would would as a player and as now as a uh, commentator, would you like to see the actual contract for Sky being a little bit less to the European Tour and Sky actually having to increase? their uh, spend on their production of each week of the tournaments 
because it seems to have um, when you listen to other people, the the, the Sky commentary and, and the coverage, uh, their spend has decreased while while the actual viewership is now decreasing as well in golf. So we would like to see the the um, the coverage get that little bit better. Um, and I'm not talking about commentators, of course, but I'm talking about having cameras in certain places, more cameras, more people out there uh, to show more shots rather than you know hit seeing one or two shots commentary one or two shots commentary when you actually you know make it a little bit more interesting for the viewer do you get my point yeah i do get your point uh pete and if there's any kind of ideas at all that you have about how we can make it better for the consumer if anybody listening has got any ideas by all means let the european tour know because pete kelly is very open and to all, this is his world, this media world is his world, this is the world that he's come from. He's very open to improving that. And um, we really feel that we have improved it in the last few years. European Tour Productions has gone to another level, particularly with the production of Rolex events. Um, and we spent a lot more money in the production of those. And uh, we don't have the money that the PGA Tour do, uh, NBC do in America. Um, um, but we still uh, feel that we can improve the product, absolutely. Um, there's no doubt that um, TV production uh, is key. It's an expensive business and a very, very expensive business. Um, and, and um, you know, like, like all businesses, the European tour, I think um, you're going to find a huge difference in the European tour on the back of this coronavirus. Um, I think uh, you're going to see uh, some massive changes going on from the size of the prize money to the, to the production of tournaments, to the production of TV, all of those things, because I think all of us are going to feel a huge economic chill uh, in the next few years uh, on, the, on the back of what we're going through at the moment. Um, the, the PGA Tour will be the same, um, and, and there's going to be repercussions all over the place on the back of this. There hasn't been much talked about the effects that, that, that this uh, virus is going to have on the economy, but they're going to be monumental um, from all of the people that I'm talking to and from what I'm hearing about. So... We're, we're, we're going into, uh, into, a, into a tough period of time for all of us uh, in golf and European tour as well in the next couple of years. But we're well equipped to do so. The governance is very strong and has been very strong at board level. We have a very, very strong, powerful um, European tour board. The governance is, 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 as I say, really strong. Uh, we've got some great contingencies in place for, for situations like this. And, and uh, we're also not over-reliant on Ryder Cup and TV money uh, in order to run our business um, than we might have been in the past. So, um, you know, we can, we, we can ride out the other side of it. Uh, and that's what's most important, more important than anything else. But if there's any ideas, Pete, that you could do, you know, in terms of production, TV production, it's a very expensive, expensive business. And those cameras are very expensive. And, and those shot traces that we use, I mean, those cameras are massive. And, mm -hmm. and uh, they're, they're, of they're not something well. we can... Yeah, well, I mean, it, it's to have them to have them behind every shot. Like people say, why can't you have them for every it's shot? Incredible, yeah, it's yeah. incredible. Yeah. yeah, it's a very expensive piece of kit to have. So, any other ideas at all that could add to the production? I mean, either let me know or anybody let it in. Let the European Tour know because uh, we're, we're always looking to improve the product. The European Tour, and uh, um, yeah, we've come a long way in the last few years. And the real disappointment is, I think, in the last four years, five years. Uh, un under the guidance of, of, of Keith Kelly. I think we've made incredible strides for the European Tour. I mean, imagine, Pete, when we were playing that you would have, what, eight tournaments of $7 million plus on the European Tour, and uh, plus a number at $3 million and $5 million and $2 million and you know, and, and it's a shame that a lot of that work now is going to be undone uh, on the back of this virus as we go back to a, a more streamlined European Tour um, post-corona. Do you think there might be any opportunities for another forthright Irish man with all this great European tour experience that he could maybe spend a few weeks in America covering some golf. I think I think it'll really do us all some good. They don't have enough lawyers. <laughs> uh, yeah. People hate the yeah. truth. That's the problem. People hate <laughs> people the truth. Hate the truth. <laughs> Donald Trump in the corner over there. Yeah. <laughs> oh dear. Yeah, uh, well, I think the whole landscape in golf and sport is going to change significantly, guys. I really do. I mean, listening to a lot of these conversations that we're having uh, at, at the board level and, and people, business people that I know, um, 
they they they're not painting a very a very rosy picture um on the on the back of this and uh, so we got to be prepared for it you know it's it's not about being negative it's about being prepared for it now if on the other hand things like a bit like part of getting ready for the Ryder Cup if on the other hand it turned out to be a lot better than what we predicted well that's easy to adjust to that it is, uh, but yeah. it's important to uh, to stay in the present and prepare for for what what the likelihood is yeah plan for the worst hope for the best I think is everybody's general situation mm-hmm. at the moment listen uh, Paul, again, thanks so much. Much like we massively obliged, whether you're busy or not. It's great, for, great of you to give up so much time. We might do it again in a couple of months, and, and hopefully, it's a cheerier sure. picture then. So, thanks from all of us. Much yeah. appreciated. Thanks, Paul. you're welcome. Cheers. Yeah, thanks, guys. All the best. Keep up the good work. Golf Weekly. This is OTB Sports Radio. This is OTB AM. Yeah.